My name is Olga Stella. I'm the executive director of Design Corps Detroit. And we put on these monthly Drinks by Design events um, March through September. We're you know, excited to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. We're especially happy tonight to be hosting uh, the Cooper Hewitt and a, a wonderful panel of uh, past National Design Award winners. And I'll um, have the folks from the Cooper Hewitt tell you a little bit more about that. But the other thing that's happening uh, tonight is that we're celebrating uh, the Detroit City of Design initiative. About a year ago, um, just about today, uh, we released the Detroit City of Design Action Plan, which is lays out an ambitious uh, vision to drive inclusive growth in our city through the practice of inclusive design. And you know, when we, when we released that action plan a year ago, over 50 organizations joined with Design Corps to say um, they wanted to be part of it. They had projects that could help bring the action plan to life. In fact, over 60 projects. Today we released a report, we're running some slides um, on the back wall over there with some of the highlights that really show the impact of those 50 organizations and their work. They've touched over 70,000 people in the last year. Um, they have worked together, reporting over 239 connections between themselves, which just really demonstrates the strength of this coalition. Um, one of our values is collaborative action um, and accessible opportunities. And when you look at the report, which will be in your email um, and on our website, you know, what you'll see is that you know, these are organizations and projects that are touching all corners of the city, touching all kinds of people, people who may not normally under, you know, feel and see the ways that design impacts their lives. And we're just really proud um, to be stewards of the UNESCO City of Design designation for our city, still the only one in the United States. Uh, yeah, and we're gonna try to keep it that way for a little while. And uh, <laughs> until, until the US joins UNESCO again, we will be the only US city, so. <laughs> At least another 18 months, but um, <laughs> but when you look at the at the work of the partners and just the impact in the first year alone, I mean, it's just such a great sign of what's yet to come. And working together, um, little by little, we re Detroit really will. Um, you know, become known around the world as a place where grassroots action, inclusive uh, design, inclusive collaboration um, is making the difference in creating a city that's for everyone, uh, not just for some people. So we're really excited to be able to host the Cooper Hewitt here, to have all of you, um, and to keep that momentum going. So I'm going to turn it over to Ruki and you hold uh, Ravi Kumar from the Cooper Hewitt to introduce the panel. Thanks, Olga. Like she said, I'm Ruki Nuhal Ravikumar. I'm the Director of Education at Cooper Hewitt. I'm going to set this large folder down so I can actually hold the microphone. But we're really pleased to be in Detroit. This is a great town, and look at all of you here. Um, and thanks to De Design Corps Detroit for hosting us and making us a part of Drinks by Design. Cooper Hewitt is America's design museum, and our vision is for everyone to discover the importance and power of design to change the world. And what better group to talk about change the world than the group that's in this room. As a museum, we're doing this by preserving design stories and asking really important questions about the future of design. Next month, on May 10th, we open the Design Triennial on Nature. The Triennial is a global perspective on contemporary design and really looks at where are we going in the future and how can design and nature work well together. Simply put, Cooper Hewitt is a platform to explore our world by design. It's a message that we're sharing far and wide thanks to our new campaign that you saw on view as you entered today. A huge thanks to the team that I have here. Uh, if you're in the room, I'd like to recognize Rebecca Armstrong, Michelle Cheng, Chris Gautier, who's at the back, Vasu Janopoulos, Kara Hunt, and Kim Robledo-Diga. We're a small group, but we've been all over the city. Thank you. <laughs> Olga mentioned the National Design Awards. This was established in 2000 to honor lasting achievement in American design. 
The National Design Awards is our most prominent education initiative. We celebrate our winners uh, at Cooper Hewitt every October and then take them on the road to cities around US every year. Um, this year, we're pleased to be in Detroit, and we're also celebrating the 20th anniversary of the National Design Awards program. To mark this occasion, we are adding a new category of award, Emerging Designer, to recognize the achievements of an extraordinary young talent and providing a springboard for a new career on the rise. Thanks to the major support from Target, Adobe, and countless friends, Cooper Hewitt and our NDA Cities program helps the next generation of designers be uh, and help with design literacy. We're also helping energize the next generation of designers and leaders through design workshops in areas where there's limited exposure to design. The NDA Cities program has already impacted a hundred of stu hundreds of students in Boston and San Francisco, and now we're able to do the same in Detroit. We invite you to help us as we strive to make design more inclusive and ensure its opportunities are available to all. This week, we've been training teachers and introducing students to design, design thinking, and design stories. Yesterday, we were at Lawrence Technological University. This morning, we had an absolute blast with third and fourth graders at Charles H. Wright Academy of Arts and Sciences. Tomorrow, we will be at Ludington Magnet Middle School and Stephen H. Mason Academy. On Saturday, it's almost guerrilla-style design, but join us at the Belt Alley for a collaborative Dropman design activity where we will be designing an unending park, and it goes on forever. If you had a, haven't heard about this, look out for more on cooperhewitt.org slash Detroit. Tonight, I'm really pleased that we brought together four of our previous winners um, who are involved, who are really involved in shaping Detroit through design. Our conversation will be moderated by Kara McCarty, my colleague, who is the director of Curatorial. Kara has organized major exhibitions and most recently our critically acclaimed Access Plus Ability, which has been on view in Davos at the World Economic Forum and the road ahead, reimagining mobility. The mobility exhibition has actually been our source of inspiration for the projects that we've taken to several schools this week. So welcome everyone, and without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Kara. everyone, and uh, I'm um, thrilled to be here. I want to thank Design Corps uh, for organizing today's event, and I want to thank all of you for being here. I'm really excited by the turnout. I'm excited um, to learn a lot more about Detroit in the next hour, and um, in my, my um, immersion in Detroit started this morning when I arrived um, at the airport, and I had a taxi driver who was, I think it was the best preparation for today's panel discussion. Taxi drivers are often my, the best litmus test for what's happening in a city. And when I got into his car, he said, I, he said, where are you going? I said to Detroit. I, he said to Detroit, can you hear me now? Oh, there we go, I can hear myself. So, um, so I got into the, the taxi car, cab and I, he said, where are you going? And I said, to Detroit. And he said, the big D. And I said, is there a little D? And he said, no, Detroit is coming back. That's why it's a big D uh, with a capital D. And then he proceeded to tell me all the exciting things that are happening in the city. He's lived here for 30 years. And he said that it really hit rock bottom. And the last three years, he said, it is so exciting. Um, all that's happening here. So um, I'm very excited. It's a very exciting time, as we know, for cities today. And um, we have a really robust group of panelists here who are working all over the country. And I'm interested to hear about um, ideas that they're bringing here 
and uh, what they're learning from Detroit as well. So immediately to my left is Richard Rourke, partner at Olin, base, Olin, which is based in Philadelphia. He was a 2008 Landscape Architecture Award winner. Um, next is Chris Reed, founder and director of Stoss Landscape Urbanism, based in Boston. He was a 2012 Landscape Architecture Award winner. Uh, next is Craig Wilkins, architect, academic, and author from here in Detroit, 2017 Design Mind Award winner. In fact, he's the only panelist who is from Detroit and living in Detroit. And next is David Malda, principal of Seattle-based Gustafsson Guthrie Nickel, and he was the 2011 Landscape Architecture Award. So essentially, it's a panelist of arch architecture landscape architects, um, and I um, would love to just hear how, just for a moment, how you each, um, why you chose to study landscape architecture. It's a very interesting um, design discipline. For so long, landscape architecture was, in some schools, almost the sort of secondary, um, secondary to architecture, but in the last, uh, in recent years, it has just, especially the last decade, has really catapulted to so, be so instrumental in the transformation of our cities. So if you could just say a little bit about why you chose landscape architecture. I'm going to start. Okay, I'm going to sit over here because I'm not a landscape architect. <laughs> well, I have a no. question for you, too. No, and I have a question for you, too, Craig. No, no, okay. You're an honorary landscape architect. I'm an honorary. Okay, okay, I guess that's, can we, we, we can vote on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a landscape architect because I wanted to know how the world was put together. Uh, still, still don't know how the world was all put together, but uh, that, that, that was the driving motivation. I had no idea what the practice uh, was, uh, but I had some... Um, uh, people at my university who took a look at me and said, you're a weird guy, and uh, where you know you're interested in connections, so there you go. For me, I was studying uh, cities in college. Um, first of all, it was a discovery to me that you could study cities as an academic topic. I had already uh, always been interested in that. Um, and when I went to school, um, just started looking particularly at the 19th century American city and the work of uh, Olmsted and then a series of landscape architectural practices who were really reshaping cities um, in very significant ways. Uh, the 19th century parks movement was really a response to social reform efforts. Um, they were initiated from the idea of reform in the city, cleaning up cities, making them healthier places, particularly for a lot of the workers who were there. Um, and the park systems that Olmsted conceived and designed, um, you know, took on issues of making nature in the city, but they also took on issues of flood control, providing healthy spaces, they integrated parkways and transportation ways. And I started to realize the impact you could have on cities and people writ large um, through the lens of landscape. Uh, but landscape practiced in a very integrated and expansive way, not necessarily the way it had been practiced uh, for many, many decades during the 20th century. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to break up the landscape. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so. I had always intended to be an architect. That didn't work out. Uh, but I started studying, uh, started out studying um, community development in art history, which is a very typical combination. Uh, and then went on into architecture and, and intended that all those things that I had studied about community organization and how groups, you know, gain their voice and, and projects evolve. Uh, as well as complex systems and then the whole art history thing would all come together in architecture. And so I did that, I studied architecture and then stayed on and kept taking landscape classes realizing all that stuff that I was interested in seemed like it was coming out, at least in those classes. 
uh, more and more in the discussions about landscape. And then um, I think the, the, the final thing was walking around uh, cities and realizing I had stopped looking at the buildings and was just looking at freeways and weird spaces around them and all of this other infrastructure and streets and, uh, and decided then that that maybe was where I was most interested. Okay. I'm not a landscape ar ar architect. Um, however, my, my, my interests have, um, over the last 20, maybe 25 years, have um, included um, not just the object, but the process of creating the object and where the object actually is. Um, so landscape is a part of, um, an integral part of how I see um, um, the practice of architecture, at least from my particular perspective. Other people have different perspectives. Um, it's interesting that on my way in to the building, I ran into a, a former um, student who was telling me that, that you know what, I, I, and I don't remember the advice, but he said, I, you know, I'm going to take your advice. Um, I, I'm going to apply to the landscape program. I'm like, I don't remember telling you that, but okay, that's fine. Um, but the, and, and I, I completely applaud that because, especially in Detroit, and I, I think this is absolutely true, that Detroit has something that most cities, if not all cities, envy. We have an abundance of land, right? And if you want to rethink how you design a 21st century city, it's not about plopping buildings everywhere. It's not about trying to repopulate uh, a city that at one point was 1.8 million people, which is great because that's what you needed for the industry in the city to survive. We don't need that now. So what are you going to do with this? I, it, it's a gift. What are you going to do with this gift? And you know, if you are not involving landscape architects in that, in that question, in that um, thought process, in that planning process, you are wasting this moment in time that probably won't come for an, to another city for another hundred years. So um, in that sense, you know, we're brothers up here. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, um, I, I, I honestly believe that. So. Well, that's, um, the, the, all the land can be a blessing, but it can also be a big challenge right now, right? Because of how decentralized everything can be and how to, um, but that's what I would love to hear um, everyone talk about this evening. Um, Craig is, he was awarded the, the, design, the National Design Award because of his a design mind, um, and a wonderful connector, author, architect, uh, activist, uh, recent publication, Activist Architecture. Uh, which is really uh, a very engaging and inspiring publication and very, very relevant. Um, and Craig, you said something recently um, about Detroit as a shrinking legacy city. You said the old solutions no longer apply. Our problems at this time are different. Architecture should be about that, about responding to society now, all of society, for the future. So for each of you, um, you're all, with the exception of Craig, are working elsewhere, but you're also working here in Detroit. And I would love to hear you talk about how you go about making one of our legacies of cities, which is a post-industrial city today, feel relevant. And maybe you could do that um, through the projects that you are currently working on in Detroit. If you could maybe say the projects that you're working on, because I'm not sure everyone is aware of that, and what the challenge was and how you're trying to make that feel relevant. Today. I'll start. I have no work in Detroit, uh, but would love to have some work in Detroit. Um, 
I was part of a team that worked on Detroit Future City and then a number of subsequent projects. Um, and Olga, who introduced us this, um, uh, this evening, was, was part of that work as well. Um, so this was previous admin administration, pre-bankruptcy uh, and all that. Um, but we were looking around the city with, a, with, with an amazing team of people, some of whom were from out of town, some of whom were from here. DCDC was involved, Dan Patera, um, uh, folks at Hamilton Anderson, uh, and a number of others. Um, and one of the things that struck us too was the, uh, the abundance of vacant land. Um, and of course, up until that point, so many people had been talking about loss, uh, loss of population, blight, all, all, all the issues. And, and at the very beginning of the process, frankly, there was a lot of pent up anger uh, understandably so, among residents who had lost services and, and all those sorts of things. But we started looking, like Craig uh, had implied or said, uh, at, at vacant land is real opportunity. Uh, no other city uh, in the United States had this much land available for reimagining. Um, and we knew from the start that, that normative uh, urban design, infill approaches would not work here. There was too much land, not enough people, not enough economy to support that. And so we really started to think about what are the various ways that land could be reimagined. Um, there were already a lot of amazing groups and individuals doing uh, community uh, agriculture and farming. Uh, there was some good work going on on the ground, emergent, uh, around issues of stormwater and green infrastructure. There, there were the beginnings of, of uh, initiatives um, uh, about tree planting, nurseries, things that, that, that eventually spawned uh, initiatives like Hans Farms. And we started looking around and saying, you know, there's really something here. Uh, how can you imagine investing in landscape um, opportunities in, in, in landscape programs in a way that would completely reshape the city and simultaneously uh, make investments uh, for new development in pl places where people already lived. Um, there was also the opportunity in between to put in place some pretty interesting new ways of living in the city, some of which people were doing already by default. They didn't have a choice. Sometimes they didn't have electricity. They had to live off the grid. They had to grow their own food. But we, we saw some energy and some potential there and said, if you can do this as a choice, why not integrate it into the way in which Detroit um, uh, was imagined as a 21st century city? And so for us, uh, these ideas about uh, reutilizing landscape in, in, in an array of, of productive and socially active ways was really at the heart of uh, that project. We're now taking those lessons to other cities. So we're working in St. Louis um, on a 20 mile greenway, um, a greenway that both connects some of the stronger areas of the city and some of the areas that have been historically um, disinvested uh, discriminated against. In St. Louis, there's a very sharp uh, color divide, and that color divide is really white and black. Um, and so our proposal really um, moved across that line and said, in order to do this project properly, you had to invest in places uh, where poor and dis disenfranchised people lived uh, and make investments there as well. And so some of the lessons that we had started to think about, which are now actually being put into place uh, with the current administration here, are now being exported to other places like St. Louis through, through some of this work. Richard, maybe you could um, follow up and talk about, I know that economics are really um, a driver of a lot of your, your way of analyzing cities, and maybe you could talk about your Eastern Market project? Sure, uh, and I, I think it, it builds off naturally because uh, Dan Patera and DCDC were also involved. Uh, uh, and it, it built off of, uh, of the future city vision as, as well in terms of looking at um, areas of Detroit and, and their economic future. 
Um, the Detroit Eastern Market 2025 strategy plan was um, a really a revelatory experience uh, for me in a planning process because the questions were start, starting with Ad, Adam Smith is like capitalism is you know land labor and capital uh, and we never really think about what the labor is like some like the people who just show up for the factory or something and we we have a way of looking at, at infrastructure and how we build an economy in a way that we're waiting for a new manufacturing plant to come or, or some, some other large industry to come in. And the, you know, going back 250 years when we were an agrarian society, all the economics was landscape. And now today, there's no economics outside, all the economics is inside. Uh, except for farming. And I, I think the, um, the interesting thing about the state of Michigan is that you're both a very industrial state and at the same time, you're a farming state. And these two economies get figured out in Eastern market where you have these different levels of um, industry players from the big factory types to um, uh, uh, farmers and the scale of farming from industry scale farming to actually small family farms that actually still do exist to um, the restaurateurs to uh, the, the grocery systems that depend on it. There's a two billion dollar nexus in Eastern Market and the crazy crazy thing about this place is that people go there and they like it but it's an economic engine. It's like I'm walking into an economic engine. That's what Eastern Market is. And, and that, that, that for a landscape architect, that was just like, whoa, people enjoy being inside an economic engine because you can exchange real things there. You can, you, you, you can actually uh, have um, a, a relationship with what sustains you and you can take joy from the people who are providing that. And um, what the Eastern Market vision was about was how do, you, how do you keep doing that now? And Eastern Market has had real problems because the scale of logistics um, you know, has driven a lot of the food supply chain to say, rather than work with all these kind of like dense city areas, let's just go out to a, a green field next to an interstate connection and make it work there. And the, the vision that we needed to take on in terms of looking at the landscape and looking at finding what to do with the land was asking how do these businesses exist today and have a footprint in Detroit and you can actually retool to the modern food economy here because you do have that opportunity of land um, but what's what's really special about it is that um, at, at Eastern Market you um, can be somebody who like has their own specialty dishes and there is a commercial uh, kitchen there that you don't have to you know go through all the rigmarole with the insurance you don't have to um, you, you know find the capital to build this facility you share it and what we need to do today what I'm what I'm advocating for is we need to have a new infrastructure that's an opportunity infrastructure that allows more of these things where we, we're not just waiting for a big capital venture to come through, but we're providing an infrastructure where people can share insured spaces, where people can get to work uh, in ways that they don't need to buy a car for. That this, this kind of thinking needs to play out into how we think about the economies of the future. And that was you know, a learning moment uh, for, at Eastern Market and the planning work that we did. Sure. I, uh, just to add on to that briefly, we uh, were one of the finalists on the West Riverfront competition. Finalists, unfortunately. Uh, and then, <laughs> the, right. Uh, and then I have also been doing a little bit of um, planning work with Rosetti uh, in the Brewster Douglas uh, area, and that project, I think, in, in particular, is one that, to me, had a lot of um, really intense moments in thinking about this city and the history of this city. 
Because we're certainly thinking about what is it today, what is it moving forward, uh, but a big part of how we approach design is trying to understand how to find some resonance with what's already there. You know, when we're working on a landscape, we're always working with something that's already there. Um, it's people, it's the ground, it's all the, the stuff that's been built up over years and years of a lot of different ideas and a lot of different priorities that have been tested and tried and um, you know, usually only partially realized and then at other times completely erased. So, you know, that uh, neighborhood went through drastic transformations over the last hundred years from Hastings Street to a freeway to um, housing towers and now you know what what should be there uh, that can respect all of that and, and engage that as best we can but you know no one's living there on that site today um, and so how do we find some way to connect people to those stories uh, especially the ones that have been wiped out and not just in an explicitly didactic way, um, but that can be part of it, but also just to make it feel like it's still familiar, like it's not something that's totally foreign and has been brought in. So we spend a lot of time trying to understand the history of the place. What are the stories? What, what are people not getting exposure or connection to now through talking to people, through archival research and maps and all that kind of stuff, so that we can try to get that conversation going about uh, all the things that have been here and still matter, uh, but maybe just have gotten eroded with time. Um, I, I can, I want to try maybe to connect a couple of things here. There's something that you said about um, looking at sort of ec um, this economic engine, being in an economic engine, and um, this idea about sort of looking at connecting. Can you put your microphone up, please? Wow, well, I have never been told I have not, I'm not loud enough. <laughs> this is the first. Um, okay, um, that better? Okay, good. Um, so so the, the most recent, I, I, I do a lot of consulting with uh, um, organizations, institutions, and firms, um, both here and around the country, the most recent is uh, is probably the um, um, the DIA competition for their uh, um, town <laughs> their uh, the, the DIA Plaza competition, um, and in you know it's 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 telling that the uh, the lead for that project was a landscape architect. Um, our conversations consistently uh, among the team was very much about, maybe not so much about how to be in an economic engine, but how do you sort of rethink the landscape? How do you rethink a space, not through the, not through the lens of economics, but through the lens of civics? How do you think about encouraging people to get out of their increasingly tight bubbles. We get our, we get our, um, our uh, news from things that sort of reinforce our view of the world. We tap into social, social media that reinforces our view of the world. There are very few spaces today that allow for that sort of happenstance, where you bump into somebody that doesn't think the way you do, and you have to engage that person. You have to think, and maybe, hopefully, that engagement makes you think differently, right? So that, that's not an economic, it might lead to something economic, right? But that's not the goal. The goal is to actually get people to engage each other face-to-face, -face, not on Facebook, not tweeting, not Instagram. You know, th th this, is, this is the public realm, and it's public for a reason, right? It is public because we want folks to actually have to work out face-to-face -face messy questions, messy issues. And so that, that was really the kinds of things that we wanted to do in our in our sort of our, our proposal for the um, DIA 
uh, project. And we, the, our, our, our central focus was that landscape can do that. That working in the land, it's not a building, it's a space, it's a place. It's a place where you feel comfortable, and it's also a place where you feel comfortable having maybe diffi difficult conversations that you might not have any place else. So the, for, for, for me, um, the, 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 and you know, I'm, I'm saying it for me, but I also, you know, I'm speaking a little bit for our team, that the, the, the idea behind our proposal for the DIA project, uh, uh, which is the most recent one that, that I've, been worked on, I've worked on here in, in Detroit, is that we, we're, we're, we're trying to use our public space as a public forum. You know, this, it's too easy to put stuff down on Facebook. It's too easy to put stuff down on, on, um, on Twitter. Um, and so how do you use our shared environment, our shared landscape that we can't ignore? We all have to walk outside our houses. We all have to, we all have to engage the city in some way. We all have to engage space in some way. How can we shape that space that encourages that happenstance, that encourages that conversation, that encourages us to, to maybe not watch, um, and this, is, I'm not, this isn't a pejorative thing, but not watch Fox News all the time, or not, watch, or not listen to NPR all the time, right? How do we engage people in, because we, we are increasingly becoming siloed and in bubbles, right? The, really, the, one of the few things that we share is the landscape. How do we use that to trouble that bubble? So one of the, the um, things that I've been hearing um, you all talk about and I've been reading about is that actually a lot of these, I mean, it's extraordinary all the, um, not the number of projects that are going on in Detroit right now. I mean, it's like all eyes on Detroit right now in the world. I mean, there are so many of the best architecture, landscape designers, urban designers um, from around the world who are working on projects in Detroit right now. It's, it's um, I don't think there's any other place like it. So, and there's a lot of these um, individual initiatives in this large um, space that we're talking about how are we, how are you um, engaging the communities to really find out their values, um, to sort of create these new neighborhoods that, that they feel are theirs and who do the social, in, to, ha to encourage the social interactions that you're describing? Like how are the streets changing in the areas that you're, you're working on and? I think that's a, a really big, challenge that we have wherever we're working, which is how are we taking advantage of our experience and ideas, uh, but not just dropping those in, you know, from afar. And uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of times that gets boiled down to a discussion of program. So what's the right program to go in this park? And in that sort of the extent of what public engagement means. Uh, but when we think about a, like a park, say, um, I think the goal is exactly what you're describing. It's a space where people, for different reasons, are going to come there, and they're going to see each other, whether it's intentional or unintentional, uh, and that kind of interaction, uh, I believe, is beneficial in, in part of what's you know, the best about cities, as opposed to just interesting old buildings or you know, something like that. So uh, the engagement process, as we like to try to approach it, is one, it's not just us. We always have really good teammates wherever we are. That's a key thing, because they know people, and those people know people, et cetera. Um, but we also, I think, importantly strive to say that the, that public process is actually starting in that engagement process. So it's not just, let's all figure this out so then we can do a park, so then maybe the park can do that. But that conversation, that kind of engagement and crossing of paths starts in the design process. Uh, and I think that's, that's a, a really important aspect of public space design, uh, especially when so many public spaces now are really just a host to a lot of very discrete consumption opportunities. 
we take this issue on in a number of ways. Um, you know, a lot of the engagement we do, um, we're certainly interested in asking what do you think and what do you know, but we're also interested in getting people out of, out of a room, um, out of uh, an environment where uh, they're simply responding to thing, prompts we've put on the table for them. Um, a lot of the work we're doing now is highly interactive, it's highly engaged, it's on sites, it's testing out ideas, it's getting people to let their guard down and not think in a room about maybe what I think I want my kid to be able to do, but actually have things available in a particular place which offer kids the ability to do things and then they can actually give us feedback on what it is that they think and like and, and frankly, how they're just responding to what's in front of them uh, in a very unselfconscious way. And so we try to break down those barriers so that people can just interact um, uh, and be there with us. We also have, um, in St. Louis, we're having some pretty important and tough conversations about the city's um, uh, past um, and its legacy of social relations and race relations. Um, with Tony Griffin, um, we're working on an uh, equity strategy that really talks about race and social relations and says, what, what is equity? What does equity mean to you? Um, we're not interested in giving people our definition of what equity is, but actually figuring out uh, the ways in which equity can play out in a particular um, uh, community. But we are pushing. Um, the issue. We are, uh, in the research work that we've just completed, certainly we want to talk about the city's iconic history, some of the real heart and soul of what people already know St. Louis is. Um, but it's really important to us and the team uh, to put on the table some of the harder histories uh, that St. Louis has experienced to be able to talk about those histories and confront those issues as a starting point for a real conversation about what the future can be. If indeed this project is gonna tackle some of the most pressing social and racial and economic issues um, in any city uh, today, how is it that we acknowledge what's already happened as a starting point, uh, as an honest starting point uh, to be able to build uh, new conversations uh, on. And I think, again, for us, so much of that thinking was really born here in Detroit in terms of the ways in which that, that we were engaging people, the role that design could play and designers could play, even though some of those questions are not design issues, actually, in some cases, design can help move us forward um, uh, as, a, as a vehicle for bringing people together. Um, and I think there are great opportunities. As we know, um, for so in so many of our cities, design has brought about a lot of the social injustices, the the federal highway systems, the public policies, and it's. I think, as you said, Chris, it's really important how how can design play a role in addressing these social injustices, and I think that's gonna be one of the, the key things moving forward and, and considering any solution um, to our cities. And you know, here in Detroit where so many people um, who remained in Detroit without, when it had really declined so much, um, with 40% of the people I understand still do not have internet access here in Detroit, 30% do not have a bank account, savings account, I mean, there's just a lot of things that are really, really going to be critical in as, as the city moves forward and in taking into account. I have a taxi cab confessional. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, were you the driver? No. Uh, <laughs> n n nobody, nobody, nobody trusts me to drive anymore. Uh, so 
uh, I, I was I was on, on the way here. Um, the the guy the guy was telling me um, about what a park is in Detroit. A park is an open space and three other things in it. Uh, and and uh, and I was like thinking about this this conversation that that we're that we're having is to be really honest about landscape architecture, a deep, dark truth, is um, I'm always jealous of architects because most of the time the client comes and says, here's the program, these are the square footages, you make design out of it, you know? Or you, there, there, there's a few things that need to be tested or there's assumptions that are way off the you know, wall in terms of cost per square foot, but there's a pretty concrete idea about what the program is gonna be. In landscape architecture, it's the, the, the creative opportunity is nobody knows what it really should be, but you spend about half your fee trying to get to a program that people are like, yeah, I want to do that, and, you, and then you spend the, the rest of the half VEing down to what you can actually do. Um, sad. Uh, but um, the, the design, I think, at its best is an act of um, creative and collaborative intelligence, and what we try and do um, in our in our dialogues is really uh, build program as fast as possible, and we really need to be more adept at creating programs for landscape because it's not about being kind of nice, you know, or something that you should do if you're a good person. You make landscapes. Um, it it. It has to be desire and drive, and I need this to be a part of my life. And there are, there's a lot of good reasons why we do need it to be a part of our life. We're all dying way too early, and part of it is because we're not living outside. We, we need to live outside more. We need to do things outside more. And we, we're, we need to create structures that, that get us uh, to, to that point. So what the dialogues that need to happen with communities, what do you really need to do out there? And I think health is a major component, but a reason to do healthy things outside and why it's way better than a gym, that's a way of thinking about, I need to have this landscape. So um, for eight years, uh, I was the um, director of the design center the Detroit Community Design Center at the University of uh, Michigan. He, it was located here in Detroit. And like all design centers, you know, we're, they're primarily set up to provide access to professional expertise, whether it's architectural, landscape, urban design, um, uh, planning, uh, public policy, um, because we're a public institution. And so sometimes, you know, communities and neighborhoods, not sometimes, almost all the time, there's some community or neighborhood that needs access to that information so that they can uh, sort of maybe begin to rethink or even initially think about, you know, their, their place in the world and their, their location within uh, a metropolitan area or a city or whatever. So we were sort of the, you, you might sort of say we were, like the public defender for any in law. We provided the kinds of services that allowed people to push back on issues that perhaps didn't necessarily serve them. Like, I don't want that building in my neighborhood, or I don't want you to buy up, a, I don't want you to speculate in my neighborhood. Anyway, so uh, that's if you, you know, that's just a very short and probably less than accurate understanding of what design centers do. But when, so that, that, that required us, it was, a, it, was a, it was not, actually I take it back, it wasn't a requirement. It was our mantra, it was our reason for being, was to actually work in neighborhoods and communities. And um, you've probably heard this thousand times before, but I'm just going to repeat it because it's actually true, is that we approach architecture and we approach design. Um, not, we, we, didn't, we didn't want to design for someone. We wanted to design with someone. Right? We wanted the folks to be part of the process. And here's the, here's the thing I'm going to say, and hopefully this isn't being taped because I'm going to, somebody's going to come back on me on this. Um, uh, it's being taped? Okay. Cut this. Uh, <laughs> 
you can, you can edit this out, right? Um, it is, um, I, the way I ran the center is that I wanted us to be obsolete. And what I mean by that is we wanted to educate folks in the process. We wanted to give them the language by which they could actually have conversations with the city. They can have conversations with developers. They can have conversations with our uh, housing advocates that they didn't need our help. They might want our help, but they didn't need our help. We wanted to, we wanted to sort of provide them with the tools by which you feel confident about stepping up to the microphone in a, in a, a zoning adjustment council and say, no, we don't want that and this is why we don't want that. Or, yes, this is where we want you to invest your money, and here's why. That, that, that was our position. Like, we, we, we couldn't be everywhere, and we didn't want to be everywhere, but we wanted people to be able to, to actually own the, um, the, the hopes and desires that they had in those locations. Not, you won't always be successful, that no one was promising that, but w our process was, yeah, we can provide these professional services with, uh, with you, and we can give you the sort of the, the tools that we, you, can, you, can, you can step up to the plate and make your argument, and you know, we can stay with you as long as you want. But we're hoping that you won't want us to stay with you longer, because you can take it from here. So that was always our goal, and try, Try arguing that at an institution that is funding you. Like, we want to be obsolete. Well, why am I giving you money? That doesn't make any sense. If you want to be obsolete, well, stop funding you now. Anyway, but that's another story. <laughs> but that was our goal. That was our goal. It, it took a little bit. We had people who, we hired people who worked with us. It was, it was kind of a, a thing for them to have to come to that position, but they understood what the objective was. That, ob that, that obs the being obsolete may not be in a year. It might be 20 years from now. But the goal was that we won't need community de uh, design centers anymore because we've educated so many people that they know how to proceed. It's a similar goal of Cooper Hewitt is to empower our visitors um, uh, with design and knowing how to question their environment and become much more active in the, in the design process. And so we have similar goals. Um, I'd love to keep asking questions, but I'd also like to turn this over to um, the audience. And we welcome about 10 minutes of q and If anyone has questions, we have a microphone. If you want to raise your hand if you've got a question. Is there no question I can, I've got, oh, okay. Questions are coming. Oh, Sorry, wait a second. I don't know. A certain degree of insomnia. <laughs> okay, I'm going to repeat the question just for those of you who may not have heard. Um, is that what are the key attributes one needs to become a successful designer? Tenacity. Empathy. Really caring about a place and the people who are there. Yeah, being inspired and then messing with it. The, the, the willingness to admit you fuck something up and you want to do it again. Can I say that? <laughs> Too late. Not the editor. Too late. <laughs> before, it's, before it's realized. Like, you know. The, the ability to know that you have a level of expertise that needs to be respected, but other people do as well. And I think 
also that you have to keep learning about everything and, and just be kind of obsessive about everything you're touching because you, you're an expert in some sense, but there's always a lot more. So it's, it's kind of both. You should be obsessive about your design values, but you should be open, you know? You, you should be penetrable. And you, you're, you're, not a, you're not an island if you're designing for everyone. So you have this dynamic to maintain of being like totally committed to, you know, the art of making amazing space and form uh, and performance. But you can't separate that, 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 those values from the people who have to live with your values. You're next. You're right. You're right. Just look and listen and learn from everything around you. The ability to ask a question and then like write notes when people respond. I don't see you writing anything. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on. Another question right here. Oh, sorry. I just had a question. Um, how, how are landscape architects, uh, landscape designers, responding to new ideas about mobility? Great question in the automotive epicenter of the world. <laughs> I, I think uh, mo mobility is a, a huge issue because it's part of our boundary problem. Like, like we, we live with some systems of, of mobility that actually you know, create and enforce separation. If we need to move at, you know, 70 miles an hour, that's going to put some offset distances between us. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, we're the, you know, everybody's talking about the the driverless car now um, being a thing. And and I actually had you know a couple of clients say, you know, I have clients building a 7,000 car parking garage, and I'm asking them, is this going to be useful, you know, later? <laughs> But um, I think the, the other mobility issue has to do with, uh, I think, it is, is, is twofold. We, we have the, the rise of the autonomous vehicle, and we also have the need to not move ourselves with just motors. We have to move our bodies or we're going to die. Um, and th those, are, um, uh, th those are kind of the two poles that we're wrestling with. I, I, I would add... Bring What's with the death much? thing? Uh, okay. uh, well, well, I'm a Black well, Sabbath type. <laughs> I think it, when you're talking about mobility and landscape too, you, it's not isolating mobility because that's usually when we've gotten in trouble in cities is when it's like all about the bike lane and then you forget about the other people even though that's um, you know radical thinking or it's all about the car and you end up with freeways. So uh, remembering that it's space and it's shared, and it's a part of a whole bunch of other things that our landscapes have to be doing. We don't you know, get to just do one thing anymore. Yeah, we do it all the time. I mean, and, and there, there are folks better equipped to talk about smart cities and all that stuff. Um, what fascinates me is actually the incredible adaptability of the street, right? I mean, yeah, it's put in place. Yes, it was designed for the automobile uh, in favor of other modes of, of walking around and human beings and all that. But I think around the world you see this incredible way in which people are reimagining cities, uh, streets, all the time. And that, that for me is, is what's interesting to it, is there is this piece of infrastructure. It does a lot of stuff. There, there's stuff underground, there's stuff on the ground. It moves people around, and yet you can still reimagine it over and over and over and over again. It can become a temporary uh, party space. It can become parking spaces that turn into gardens. Um, uh, the, the street edges can be reconfigured. In, in St. Louis, where the streets like here are just too wide, they're, they're um, over capacity for, for what's needed. You know, the Greenway project that we're doing will completely reimagine some of those streets. But the, the, the fact that you have a piece of infrastructure that can continuously be reimagined according to whatever the values of the people are and the technologies that exist is what fascinates me. Great, another question over here. Hi, um, softball question for you. 
Um, what cities do you <laughs> consider to be the landscape design role models or icons that we can kind of look to for inspiration here? You could say you're, you could say Detroit. Okay. <laughs> Knock yourself out. It's pandering, but you can say it. <laughs> I, I need to because I've been depressing the audience. That's true. Uh, That's true. Um, I, I, I think that that um, the Detroit is, is is fascinating because it is uh, an incubator for basically a lot of of the new ideas that are that are happening in landscape in terms of like looking at landscape as, as an economic engine, looking at, um, you know, letting uh, people have more free reign over, you know, space that is, you know, quote unquote, you know, uh, in somebody's theoretical parcel database. And I think that um, how we draw borders, um, you know, with, our, with, with ourselves and, and the way that you're thinking about watersheds, the water crisis, you know, in Michigan, um, has actually, you know, created some really innovative thinking about, um, you know, how we're stewards and how much should we pay for it. And I, I think that, um, that, you know, Dequinder Cut, you know, I think that the, all the properties that are just like, you know, people are doing their own kind of, you know, seed bomb thing is, is like, it's, it's, it's powerful the lack of control in, in some places and in, in, a, in a positive way because a lot of people have said, hey, nobody's coming in to do it. We, we, ha we have to do it. So I think that channelization is really, is really powerful. I think there's a lot of cities that have incredible legacy histories of parks of multifunctionalism. I mean, I think the Olmstead legacy, we're always trying to, to beat it or rise up to it. Um, you know, Olmsted, you know, first saw, you know, parks as this incredible social mixing ground. And he, he really did need people like, you know, you're, you're talking, Craig, about like, we need to go out and see each other. I mean, Olmsted was highly reactive to that because he'd just been through the Civil War. He was on the, he was on the Sanitary Commission and, 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 and he saw the conditions people were, were living in by not knowing each other and not seeing each other and the critical you know, f faults that that was, that was causing. So, you know, Boston and New York have that great Olmsted legacy, although they got to design every damn place at least once. Um, Philly is a, is a great one coming from where, uh, where I am the, in terms of the, they looked at the, 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 the Schuylkill River and they said, you know what? That needs to be, floodplain needs to be parks. And it has been this enduring, continuous value proposition ever since for the health and welfare of everybody in Philadelphia. I'm working in Los Angeles on the Los Angeles River uh, right now. And the, uh, my client is the uh, county public works in charge of pipes and sewage. But they are working on, uh, our plan is, uh, is about looking at landscape mitigating gentrification, mitigating displacement, using uh, land banking strategies for th uh, thinking about permanent supportive housing. So it, you should look at the cities that are, are coping with the, the realities now, I think, as measures. Um, and then you should look at the cities that have park bones that are holding them together. I, I would. I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question exactly the way you, you positioned it, and f forgive me for that. But I don't know how many people, how many people here are familiar with Loveland Technologies? Okay, um, uh, this is not necessarily a plug, but they are an awesome organization. They have done the kinds of things that, you know, the city was, was not able to do because of funding or focus or whatever. They, they, have they have mapped the entire city of Detroit. They found who owns what property. They have uh, uh, linked it to tax bases. It is, it, is, it is an amazing resource if you're thinking about um, how the city develops. However, it is primarily an economic thing. It looks at tax bases. It looks at you know how long. It, it, it's it's about where money is going. 
And it would be an amazing thing if there was someone in this room, not me, um, who would actually look at, with the same kind of depth and sensitivity, how places, how these, how lots are being used, right? That is, that's different than how much money it's bringing into the city or how much it might bring into the city or how much the city has to invest to cover the fact that you know, there's no taxes, there's no tax base here. How are, how, is, how are these places being used and engaged? That would be an amazing starting point for trying to rethink how we shape this city. I don't know if other cities have the kinds of conditions that we have. I always, I think of Detroit as being just sort of, um, sort of these urban conditions on steroids. It's just sort of hyper here. It, it's just, it really is. It's just really sort of hyper here. And because I live here, um, I can sort of say this and maybe get away with it. Um, that I don't, I, I, I don't care about the other. I care about this place, right? And so if we could try and kind of map that and really mesh the two together, man, we could have a citywide conversation about where are we going in the next 10 years and how are we going to include everybody in that process uh, two random thoughts for you um, one is the beach um, uh, particularly a beach like the beach along the coast in Los Angeles um, which is highly accessible to a lot of different people in a lot of different communities I find that to be an incredibly democratic place that's right on the edge between land and sea. It's subject to incredible environmental forces, and it's just an, a powerful mixing ground. On the other hand, you know, Renaissance Italian gardens, which are just fantastical places, um, uh, especially now that they're getting older and older and older and things drip and accumulate and get mossy and dirty and you know, wonderfully mucky, right? Um, there's a moment I went into to a, a, a cave and, and there's a hole in the cave and, and it was a warm day and all you could feel was cool air uh, coming out of the cliff, right? The complete immersion in sensorial experience uh, was what really struck me uh, at that place. David, got to add on to that. You want to next? Okay. I, uh, so I'm going to answer your question directly now. That was an indirect answer. Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I can't believe how fast our uh, hour has passed. Um, I think we're all going to be here for a while, so um, you can continue your questions one-on-one -on -one with the panelists as well as myself. But I would like to thank, in addition to all of you who, for coming this evening, I would like to Thank Design Corps, uh, Mogo, for lending us this really inspiring space. And Detroit Dart. <laughs>